Father, we thank you. We thank you, Daddy. Your, our Daddy in heaven, we thank you. Heavenly Father, for your Son, the greatest gift we could ever, ever have. And, and the fact we can come and in, enjoy and celebrate the name of Jesus today, our King, who's overcome death. I pray, God, you would reach into every single heart this morning, into lives, into the future of people's lives, into their past. I pray that you would come today and make your name great, Jesus, as you pour out your good news upon hungry and thirsty souls. I pray this in Jesus' magnificent name. Amen. Amen. You're welcome to open your Bible or your smartphone to John chapter 20. I'd like to wish you a happy Easter. And I had a few of my friends and a couple of you this morning say, oh, happy Easter, and give me a hug. It sounds, I said it as well, it sounds shallow to say happy Easter. I mean, Merry Christmas, okay, that goes a bit deeper than happy Easter. But, but happy Easter just doesn't sound right. There's a couple sitting on that side of the hall. They came on Friday and said to me, you know, this time of the year is our greatest time to celebrate. Way more than Christmas. I think, yeah, you're right. You're 100% right on that. So, so I do wish you happy Easter, but it doesn't sound right. Clint, on, on Friday, you spoke about the meaning of the week leading up to Easter, and you unpacked it, and you said it was Passion Week. I love that, man. And so if you weren't here on Friday, you're welcome to get the podcast just to listen to that. It was a, a proper, proper preach there. But, but there's something to be said about Resurrection Sunday. Something to be said about today. And I don't think we put enough emphasis, I don't think we put the spotlight enough on this day, on Resurrection Sunday, we put up new billboards around the hall today, just some statements about resurrection Sunday. You know what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? He says this, he says, if it wasn't for Sunday, our faith would be meaningless, our future would be hopeless, our preaching would be pointless, and the cross would be worthless. That's what he says. But in verse 20, he says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Therefore, what a big, weighty, deep, therefore. Therefore, because Christ has been raised from the dead, our faith is fearless. Our future is glorious. Our preaching is powerful. And the cross is victorious. Can we say amen to that? Amen. What a difference the third day makes. What a difference Resurrection Sunday makes. Jesus changes everything. That's what I want us to talk about today, friends. Jesus changes everything. And I want to ask you today on Resurrection Sunday, right now today, is Jesus changing everything in your life? Is Jesus changing the way you speak? Is Jesus changing the way you think? Is Jesus changing the way you act? Is Jesus changing the way you spend? Right now, is the name of Jesus changing everything in your life? And so we're going to take a tiny little phrase, a golden nugget from what Jesus says, something massive. And we find it here in John chapter 20. Open it up there with me. And you're saying, ah, oh, don't worry, Daryl, I didn't bring my Bible because I'll find it on the screen. Sorry, it's not on the screen. You've got to bring your Bible. If you're visiting for the first time, Freedom Church is a training center. We have to bring our Bibles or open it up on our smartphones. So stay with me, verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. His name was John. And she said, they've taken him out of the tomb. We don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple, John, started for the tomb. I love this part here, friends. Look at what it says. It says, both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. It's like boys will be boys. <laughs> boys will be boys. If it's not a CrossFit doing more reps than your mate, then it's on the bicycle. It was hard yesterday, mom, because these guys ganged up against me in their specialized team. It's hard. But boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. If it's not on the golf course or at CrossFit or racing here on Great North Road in your ST, boys will be boys. The other disciple outran Peter 
and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. The Greek meaning of that verse of the strips of linen lying there means that the strips of linen were just not unwrapped and left in an untidy pile. The the strips of linen were left lying there in the same shape of a body. It was as if the body was still there, but the body wasn't wrapped up. The body was no longer there. That's what it means in the Greek. They weren't just unpiled in a little nasty, untidy pile. They were wrapped. They were unwrapped nicely, as if the body was still in the linen. Then Simon Peter came along behind him. It's funny, like hashtag, you beat me to the grave, but did you go in? No, I was too scared. (laughs) So so Simon Peter went straight into the tomb. You can read it there, not my own words. I just added straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. You get the picture there, friends. The linen's lying there, the same shape of the body. The head cloth left separate on its own. And you're saying, oh, Daryl, what's the big deal? Why, why so much detail to that? I've got a theory about that. And I shared my theory with my wife this week. And she's like, oh, that sounds pretty good, but where do you see it in the Bible? And I don't. So I can't share it with you because there's some deep theologian sitting here that'll probably shoot me down. If it's not from the Bible. But I got my theory. And if you twist my arm just a little bit. But I might share it with you. Because my wife's in kids and she won't know. (laughs) But anyway. Let's carry on reading verse 8. Finally. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first. The scary cat. Finally he goes inside. He saw and believed. Take a look at verse 9 there friends. They still did not understand the scripture. That Jesus had to rise from the dead. They still did not understand the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. The cross wasn't enough. Good Friday wasn't enough. Jesus had to rise from the dead. Why, friends? Because that showed that the heavenly father, our father in heaven, was satisfied with the sacrifice. That was enough. Jesus rising from the dead was enough. Have you ever done something or said something, and uh, you've gone and, and you, you've, maybe you've crashed someone on their, on their bicycle by accident, or you've caused a car accident, and it's like, man, I'm so sorry. And it's not enough. Saying sorry is just not enough for the damage, or the hurt, or the pain that you've caused. Has that ever happened to you? Sorry is not enough. Or how about this one? Maybe someone has done something to you, and, and it's really hurt, and they've come to you, and they've just said, oh, I'm sorry, eh? And it's like, hey, bud. Words are not enough. Actions. Saying sorry is just not enough. I want to tell you, on Resurrection Sunday, Jesus was enough. And Jesus will for always be enough for you and I on Easter Sunday. Let's carry on reading. Let's skip a few verses. Go to verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, with the doors locked for fear of... Mm, well, for fear of the, the robbers and the thieves, you know, tough time, a lot of crime. No, no. How amazing is this? For fear of, see what it says, the Jews. For fear of the religious leaders. How sad is that? They are fearing, they're scared of the religious leaders. For fear of the Jews, the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them. Isn't that beautiful? We heard on Palm Sunday, Clint shared with us, a week before Jesus dies, the city are expecting a king. And Jesus comes into Jerusalem. Everyone's expecting a king, an entourage of soldiers and horsemen and swords and big action. No, no, Jesus came in a week ago on a donkey. And maybe Jesus thought, you know what? Now I'm going to show them that I'm the real king, that I'm victorious over death. He could have done that could have brought a whole entourage or got the room quiet first and then said, hey guys, I'm in, I'm alive. Jesus comes in and he stood. He didn't stand up. He stood among them. It's my Jesus. Come here. He's just overcome death. So he comes in, comes in, stands among them. And he says, peace be with you. He says, he didn't shout. He says, peace be with you. But he's making a declaration. 
And it's a very, very powerful declaration. This powerful one-liner I want to talk about this morning. Peace be with you. Verse 20. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Look at that. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you. Jesus is making a very big declaration here when he says that, friends. And I want us to see, for you and I, what this declaration means in 2019 here in Benoni. Number one, three things. The first point is, Jesus has made it possible for you and I to live at peace with our Heavenly Father. That's the first point. Jesus has made it possible for you and you and I to live at peace with our Heavenly Father who created us. I want us to go back to the Old Testament. I want us to see that throughout history, through all the ages, God has wanted us to be at peace with Him. And because man has never been perfect, because man will never be perfect, Jesus sent and, and, and chose a high priest to, to have interaction and engagement between him and the people. And this high priest used to put on those priestly garments. You can read about that in Exodus 28. And he was the only one who was allowed to go into the tabernacle, into the most holy of holy place. And there he used to present a sacrifice to God on behalf of the people so that they could be at peace with him. God's always had a plan. He wants us to be at peace with him. Carry on reading here in Hebrews chapter 5. Let's talk more about this high priest. It's on the screen there. Thanks, G. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. That's what I've just shared with you. He's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is a subject to weakness. That is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, because, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. Watch how the following verses are all about today. This is what Paul's saying in Hebrews. Today, the following verses are all about Resurrection Sunday. Verse 5, in the same way, Christ did not take it on himself, the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. What is Paul saying here, friends? He's reminding us of who the first high priest was, Melchizedek. And now he's quoting here from Psalm 110, where David said, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a high priest. You, my son, Jesus, are a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Friends, Jesus became my high priest and he became your high priest. But the difference between Jesus and any other high priest who ever lived is that Jesus lives forever. My high priest and your high priest lives forever. And because of that, we have peace with our heavenly father. Those four words that Jesus declared, peace be with you. They're very deep words. Th those four words, peace be with you. I think those four words were so carefully planned out even before Jesus went to the cross. We put that there for a reason because Jesus and his father always had a plan. How do we know that, friends? Janine read a, a verse this morning around communion. The prophet Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus goes to the cross. This is what Isaiah says. I was, he was pierced. For our transgressions, Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Jesus has always had a plan, friends. There's always had a, he's always had a plan for you. And uh, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And the first thing that he says to his disciples when he sees them after he's risen from the grave, peace be with you. Why is Jesus saying, peace be with you? Why, why does he use those words? Why does he point to his hands and to his side? Friends, you know why? Because he's reminding us of Isaiah 53, 700 years ago. He's reminding us that he's always had a plan all through the ages. And, and through that punishment, he brought us peace. 
And then he says, peace be with you. He shows them his hands and his side. He shows them his wounds. And the Bible says they were overjoyed. Overjoyed, happy, excited. For sure. I mean, now they're seeing with their own eyes his hands and his side. And I guess I got a sneaky feeling that in that room, there were some deep theologians who would have been nudging the standard grade people, disciples, Daryl, saying, Daryl, but yes, that's him, but he's quoting Isaiah 53. He's tying it all in. I think that's why they were really, really overjoyed. Those disciples, those same disciples needed the sacrifice of Jesus. They were with Jesus. For three years, they needed the sacrifice, and so do we. Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, friends, is about our Heavenly Father saying, that sacrifice was enough. It was enough for you and I to have peace with our Heavenly Father in heaven. Number one, peace with our Heavenly Father. Number two, peace in your relationship with yourself. What about peace with ourselves? Yo, it's a big one, eh? I mean, you can understand having peace with God, but, but having peace with yourself, th- that's challenging. I think a lot of Christians get the first one. But it, when it comes to myself, having peace with myself, I mean, I, I, I can understand that guy having peace with himself. He, he lives the perfect life. And, and she, I mean, she's picture, picture perfect. But me? No ways. Not me. I don't know. I mean, this is what I've done. This is what's happened to me. And, you, and you're thinking of stuff that you've done. Friends, I'm not trying to motivate you this morning to say, quick six steps to have peace with yourself. I want to show you from the Bible what God says about having peace with ourselves. Let's have a look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. It's, not, it's on the board there, gee, thanks. Essentially, this is saying to us, the blood of Christ purifies our conscience from acts that lead to death. From acts that lead to death. The blood of Christ purifies my conscience, purifies your conscience. You've got to get that this morning, friends. That's what God is saying. Not just living at peace with Him, your heavenly Father, but He says those acts that led to death, those things that you did, those things that you cannot forget about, it says the blood of Jesus on the cross can purify your conscience from that. Jesus changes everything. The past no longer paralyzes me. The past no longer disqualifies us, friends. Our past no longer dictates our future. I heard a statement that a lady wrote. And she said, eight years ago, I had an abortion. And I can never forgive myself. I want to tell you today, on Resurrection Sunday, you can. You can. When you, when you ask God to forgive you, friends, not only does God forgive you, not only do you have peace with him, but, but through the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross, he wants to cleanse you. He wants to cleanse your conscience, friends. And when you ask God to forgive you, you're cleansed, and he no longer holds your past against you. I want to ask you, sir, are you living with the full inheritance that God has for you? Or are you allowing your past to keep holding you back? We're singing this morning, and I, I'm not a super spiritual guy, but we were singing that song about the ring, the gold ring, the, the eternity ring that we have, our covenant with, with, with God. And I was just having a sense, maybe there's a man here today who's been unfaithful to his wife, and he says, because of that, I can never stand before God. I say to you, sir, you can today. On Resurrection Sunday. And if that is you, get my number. There's a card at the desk. I want to see you. Pastor, a mate of mine, shared how at his church, when they have eldership meetings, he always sits on the black plastic chair on the edge of the circle. Because in their pastor's lounge, they've got some nice leather couches. But he always decides to use the, the black plastic chair. And uh, one of his colleagues said to him, I've noticed Why is it that whenever we have eldership meetings, you always end up sitting on the black plastic chair just on the outside of the circle? And and my mate said to his colleague, he said, yeah, well, you know, there's some big hitters in our eldership team. There's some generals, some some top-notch guys on our team, and I'll rather let them sit on the leather couch. And his colleague said to him, you know, I don't think that's why you sit on the black plastic chair. I think you sit on that chair on the outside 
because you feel inferior and because of your past. You're not good enough to sit on the inner ring with the other elders. And my mate says it hits him right here. I want to say to you today, what is the black plastic chair that you're sitting on from your past? Because that was my mate. He's there, he's on eldership, he's one of the pastors, but he's got stuff that he's been sitting on and walking with for years. Maybe it's this, maybe the black plastic chairs, when somebody walks into the room or you see them rock up at the BB for the ride and, and there's a trigger. Someone just triggers something inside of you. Maybe it's when your smartphone rings and you see that it's your dad's name on your phone. There's a trigger. Black plastic chair from the past. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a song that you listen to on 94. There's a trigger. Maybe it's something you read. There's a trigger. And, and what happens inside of you? These emotions start welling up. Fear, anxiety, anger. Totally the opposite to what Jesus is saying. Peace be with you. And you're living with these emotions maybe eight years ago for that lady who wrote that. Maybe 18 years ago. Maybe 28 years ago. The black plastic chair. I want to say to you today, you think it's by chance that you've come to church. You think it's by chance that you're sitting here today. Resurrection Sunday changes everything. It's not by chance that you're hearing these things today and reflecting on what Jesus has done. Number one, Resurrection Sunday allows you, it allows you, ma'am, to have peace with your heavenly father. And it allows you, sir, to move on from the past. Number three. What about peace on our journey as we journey on the straight road? <laughs> Met a couple. We must have coffee. Uh, I, there's a lot happening. And immediately I think, oh, he wants to emigrate. There's a lot happening in our future. There's a lot happening in your future. And, and maybe you want peace for, for your future. Let's see what Paul says your journey will look like, your future will look like if you don't have peace from Jesus. Let's see. Let's have a look there. It says in Romans 3 verse 16, ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they've not known. Ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they've not known. The way of peace from Jesus, they haven't experienced that. All they're experiencing is ruin and misery. So if you don't have peace with God, you're going to have ruin and misery that's going to be marked all through your life. Take a look at that, friends. Ruin and misery mark their ways. Would that describe you at the moment? Ruin and misery mark your way? Brokenness? Your marriage situation? Maybe your finances? Maybe your self-image? I don't know. Ruin and misery mark your way. Do you feel like your life's a complete waste? You feel like giving up? Man, there's no hope for that situation. Like, why was I even born, maybe? Like, what's the point of getting up in the mornings for work? What's the point? I spoke to a man this week. A month ago, he went through a, an armed robbery, and he was fine. His life just carried on until two weeks ago. He couldn't get himself out of bed. Eventually, his wife says, maybe we must go to the doctor. The doctor says, do you know that you've been suffering from anxiety attacks? He couldn't get himself out of bed. It reminded me of a stage in my life where I was like, what's the point of waking up today? What's the point? And the solution is found in the same book here. Let's have a look there. Romans 16. Paul gives us this solution. If you feel like that today, it says the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Look at that again. The God of peace. God of peace will soon crush Satan. Jesus saying to you and to you, sir, on Resurrection Sunday, peace be with you. This is all part of knowing. This is all part of loving God. This is all part of being in love with Jesus and being loved by our Heavenly Father. His son, Jesus, takes that crushing, takes that waste, puts it on himself when he went to the cross so that you can be whole, so that you can be restored, so that you and I can be healed. Who would not want that? Who would not want that life and rather choose to live a life and lead a life of ruin and misery? Can I ask you, sir, would you want to choose that today on Resurrection Sunday? And yet many of us, we love the first part. We want to be at peace with God. I mean, yeah, we get that. Peace in my life, mm, 
I don't have that. Peace for my future. I'm never going to have peace for my future. And you look at your life and all you see is brokenness. And, and, and he broke up with you and you're never going to be good enough for somebody. All these things come across your life. I want to say to you today, Jesus, the great high priest, the greatest high priest, the real high priest, the true high priest has paid a price for us to have peace with our heavenly father and to be at peace with ourselves, what we've done in the past, and to have peace in our future as we go through life. My great high priest, Jesus, is coming back for us. You want to hear my theory? You want to hear my theory about that napkin? Don't shoot me down. But I did a bit of research. And in the Hebrew times, the tradition was that a master would sit at the dinner table and his servant would have set the dinner table perfectly for him. And then the master would come and sit at the table and the servant would hide away just behind the door, just enough to see if the master needed anything while he was eating. And when the master had finished eating, he would take his napkin and he would wipe his hands and he would clean his mouth and possibly clean his beard. And if he was finished, he would squinch up the napkin and he would throw it on the table and he would get up and walk away. And the servant would know, my master is finished with his meal. But if the master took the napkin and cleaned his hands, cleaned his mouth and folded the napkin neatly and left the napkin on the table neatly folded up and got up and walked away. The servant would know, my master is not yet finished. My master has left the table, but he's coming back. Friends, I think that's why Jesus got up and decided, I'm going to fold the napkin. Because he's coming back. And you say, Daryl, very, very nice story. Far-fetched. That's not in the Bible. Okay. But this is what Jesus says in Matthew verse 24. He says this. One day you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call. Then our King. Then the whole world will know. There will be a great spectacle that our Jesus is coming back for us. That's the promise, friends. From Jesus on Resurrection Sunday, Jesus who rose from the grave, Jesus that said, peace, peace be with you, peace be with you. Jesus who looks into your heart, because all we see on the outside is a beautiful girl sitting next to her husband. Jesus looks into her heart, peace, peace be with you. Peace with your heavenly father, you can be at peace with yourself from your past and peace that we can have on our journey. Friends, will you take hold of that peace today? Will you allow that peace today to radically change the way you live in a city that desperately needs it? In Jesus' name.